Baggett, CEO of Redvine Solutions. Hello, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this is a, a uh, second of a three-part webinar series. In our first uh, webinar, we actually reviewed what are the differences between WMS and MSCA. And if you didn't get the chance to attend and would like to, uh, you can visit the redlinesolutions.com website, and under the first tab item, you'll see a webcast uh, button. And when you select that, you'll be able to get straight to it. Uh, moving on to today, the second of our three-part series, we're focusing on using WMS, and we'll be doing a deeper dive on uh, WMS. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and um, uh, introduce our uh, initial speaker, which is Mike Rudolph uh, from Oracle. And Mike is a solutions architect for the supply chain management logistics team. Uh, Mike is a, uh, a renowned expert on Oracle WMS and is involved in most of Oracle's large WMS projects. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Mike Rudolph from Oracle. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Todd said, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time initially uh, talking about um, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, hold on a second here, let me get the screen uh, straightened out. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> there's the uh, obligatory uh, Oracle uh, Safe Harbor Statement, which is part of everybody's uh, presentation. Um, the real meat of what I wanted to talk about, though, for the first uh, 15 minutes or so, uh, is uh, what are some of the business drivers that uh, really people use to justify uh, warehouse management and uh, reasons that they go out and uh, and look for solutions in warehouse management. So um, I just collected four up that I wanted to talk about. The first one uh, really is uh, kind of a trend towards uh, customers ordering more frequently, so the orders being smaller and the orders being uh, higher complexity. Uh, customers asking for more specific things, uh, the makeup of the orders themselves being, you know, as they're smaller quantities, uh, uh, more complex to put together. Uh, a little bit different than just picking a full pallet of material. Um, so some of the things that need to be in place to really uh, go after uh, a business driver like that and, and fulfill it, uh, make it successful, um, you really do need some robust way planning and pick methods. So uh, in order to, to remain flexible, uh, to, to handle sort of this uh, new trend of, of processing smaller orders, it's not like uh, larger orders are just going to go away. So you need uh, way planning and pick methods that are going to be able to handle both types of scenarios and to be able to efficiently uh, execute uh, both types of scenarios. Um, the other uh, thing that's important is to have a, a warehouse management system that will provide uh, real-time fulfillment tracking. So uh, statuses and uh, visibility to the progress of orders from the time that they're planned uh, and uh, released all the way through the picking process, the packing process, and the, the loading, and, and finally the ship confirmation process. So if a, uh, uh, a system, a warehouse management system provides these capabilities, uh, you can typically uh, end up with higher fill rates and then just overall more efficient throughput. So one of the big drivers uh, that I see quite a bit is um, customers trying to handle a slightly changing uh, scenario where their orders uh, uh, are becoming smaller and more complex. Uh, another trend which has been in place for quite some time is the uh, idea that uh, operational efficiency is important. So um, with operational efficiency, uh, hold on a second here, I see the screen is uh, blinked out. Uh, with operational efficiency, um, this business driver is really around uh, optimizing cost, labor, uh, various things within the four walls of the of the distribution center. So operational efficiency is typically on the minds of uh, the uh, operations, the logistics uh, uh, folks, the VPs, the facility managers. And in order to get a good operational efficiency, uh, you need a system that can provide capabilities like uh, optimizing storage strategies, uh, optimizing the uh, pick allocation task assignment, and uh, the ability to go ahead and track the labor that's involved in all of those things in order to get a total picture of what uh, effort is, is uh, uh, happening and where that effort is being spent. So if uh, uh, operational efficiency is one of the drivers for a customer, um, they can typically, by putting in a warehouse management system, 
uh, get a, a lower total fulfillment cost uh, and increased throughput. So it's not always that uh, people are looking to uh, uh, cut heads or uh, reduce their labor force. More often than not, people are actually looking to uh, do more work with the same number of people. So they're not interested uh, necessarily in, in uh, cutting heads. They're interested in growing and increasing the capability of the distribution center without adding uh, uh, more people. The uh, third driver that I run across uh, quite a bit is a, a little bit more um, enterprise-wide, uh, and that is that um, there are definite drivers to improve uh, planning processes for inventory and kind of a move towards a more just-in-time environment. So rather than making a bunch of stuff and warehousing it and paying the cost to warehouse it uh, and uh, uh, guessing that uh, somebody will buy all of the product that you just made, um, people are, are uh, going towards shorter cycle time. So uh, making uh, smaller quantities of, of material ahead of time or purchasing smaller quantities of material ahead of time uh, and really reducing that uh, amount of storage they need in a, in a distribution center. But in order to get this uh, improved planning uh, process, being able to plan in these tighter cycles and being able to uh, optimize uh, the quantities that uh, you purchase or, or that you build, uh, you really need uh, a system in place that's going to provide with as close to real time as possible what the actual inventory positions are. So if you're making planning decisions, uh, purchasing or manufacturing decisions based on information about your inventory that is not up to date, uh, that's just going to drive planning error and could drive situations where uh, you don't purchase or make enough, you miss customer orders, customer satisfaction is a is a problem, you start running the stockouts, you have to spend more freight dollars to transfer material between different warehouses because it's not uh, positioned properly. All of that kind of drives back to uh, having your inventory positions updated uh, as real time as possible. The other aspect of uh, having improved planning and, and uh, being able to, uh, to uh, procure and, and build uh, more just in time is you've got to have a high level of inventory accuracy. Um, you know, it, it, even if your inventory is updated in real time, if it's not accurate, that has the same result or the same impact as not knowing what your inventory is. So um, a lot of customers I see are, are trying to drive towards 99.x percent uh, accuracy because, again, that just drives a, an improved planning process. And uh, both those things kind of lead to a lower carrying cost because you have to uh, uh, warehouse less stock, less product. But then if you can plan uh, properly and more closely, uh, fewer stockouts and fewer transfer, uh, less transfer act uh, activity. So a lot of times customers are looking at the distribution center as a member of a supply chain network, whereas operational efficiency is more about what's going on in the warehouse. Um, this third business driver is more about how is this warehouse interacting with the other warehouses in my supply chain network and how is it impacting other parts of the enterprise like purchasing and manufacturing. Um, the last business driver uh, that uh, I see uh, uh, quite a bit of the four that I wanted to highlight is um, regulatory compliance and uh, actually compliance and this is both regulatory and customer oriented. So. Um, I see uh, a lot of uh, drive by customers to take more control of their inbound supply chains. And by taking more control, they're asking for things like uh, advanced ship notices to be accurate. Uh, they're asking for advanced ship notices not only to be at the line item level, but down to the pallet, the actual license plate level. Uh, they're asking for specific labeling, um, all sorts of things that uh, relate to how they want the goods packed and, and labeled. Um, but then also regulatory side. So there's more focus these days, especially in pharma, food, and, and other places with uh, uh, counterfeiting, with uh, contamination, and, and other things. There's a lot more regulatory focus on uh, making sure that things like lot numbers and expiration dates and knowledge of what the makeup of a shipment is, making sure that all of that is uh, accurate. And in order to really do that, to really uh, comply with these things without adding a a, a large burden in uh, collecting the information. Um, if the uh, uh, information can be collected automatically uh, as part of a warehouse management system fulfillment process, as you're receiving goods, uh, noting what the expiration date, as you're picking goods, 
noting what the lot number is, knowing which customers you ship these goods to. Um, so in the in the sort of customer and regulatory compliance uh, sphere, um, being able to, to uh, flexibly label and, and collect data automatically uh, oftentimes leads to uh, a higher customer satisfaction because they're getting the goods the way they uh, specify. And then on the regulatory side, um, uh, a lower cost to adhere to those regulations. You can't avoid them, but you can minimize the amount of money you need to spend to adhere to them. Um, just a couple of quick uh, uh, slides on um, some distribution benchmarks that I see people using. Uh, some of these uh, relate to inbound, some to outbound. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, I thought was interesting about this is the difference between average and best in class for a lot of these metrics is not super significant. You look at uh, number eight, the, the percentage of orders shipped without errors, average of 99, best in class of 100% uh, perfect orders. That's a 1% difference. But um, that can be the difference between a uh, a decently performing distribution center and one that performs uh, very efficiently. You know, you look at uh, somebody who's fulfilling 5,000 orders a day, 1% of 5,000, 50 orders that have errors that you have to run down, track down, resolve every single day, even 1% is a, a pretty significant difference. And then uh, what I hear uh, customers uh, talk about after they uh, have implemented uh, warehouse management, some of the improvement metrics that uh, people look at uh, things like how much time, how much labor did they spend counting inventory. Um, it says up to 100% because some people are able to actually uh, completely eliminate their uh, physical inventories, for example, by going to a cycle counting program and, and having their auditors uh, buy off on it. So um, these types of, of metrics uh, encompass not just the operational efficiency in the warehouse, but also can impact other areas as well. So. You look at uh, something like customer service hours, a lot of that reduction is related to better visibility of the order status. Uh, instead of uh, customers calling in all the time, uh, asking what uh, uh, status their order is in, uh, making that uh, information uh, either available to them or being so consistent in your delivery process that they don't even bother to call you and ask anymore because they always get exactly what they ordered, the way that they wanted it, uh, within the time frame that they wanted it. So um, interesting that these metrics kind of you know cover not just operational uh, parameters within the warehouse, but also uh, again impacting other parts of the enterprise. So um, that was a little bit about uh, business drivers and why people look to acquire uh, warehouse management. Um, the next uh, couple uh, I'll just uh, talk about uh, Oracle's Oracle warehouse management um, integration. And I'll talk about uh, a couple of different uh, different options or different ways you can go about doing this. Um, it's it's important, as you could uh, hear from the the, uh, the business drivers and metrics uh, you know that we just talked about, that warehouse management not uh, stand by itself. Uh, a good warehouse management system is interacting constantly with other parts of the enterprise. So, in a, in a typical uh, Oracle eBusiness Suite implementation, where warehouse management is an integrated uh, piece of it. Um, there's uh, transactions uh, back to financials, there's uh, interaction with procurement, uh, with order management, and with inventory. So with those other modules and then sometimes other ones as well within the eBiz footprint. So um, when warehouse management uh, is part of the uh, same instance, uh, we call that integrated uh, uh, deployment. So uh, And that's been the classic standard. So ever since uh, warehouse management was uh, conceived of and uh, uh, um, designed, uh, it was kind of put together with the idea that an integrated environment uh, is best because warehouse management, again, is a part of a, uh, an entire business strategy and, and the interaction of warehouse with the rest of the company is very important. So when uh, deployed in an integrated fashion, uh, warehouse management is resident on the same instance. Uh, the, the communication with the rest of these modules is almost ins instantaneous because the interaction is happening at a database level. So there is, uh, there, uh, there is data that's collected by warehouse management that is shared with other applications, uh, but because it's all in the same instance, it all happens very quickly, very seamlessly. Um, typically, implementing warehouse management as part of an integrated instance is usually faster 
and uh, usually uh, lower uh, cost to support in the long run. Uh, faster typically because um, there are not uh, interfaces that need to be dealt with. Um, and typically uh, lower over support uh, cost, again, due to the integrated nature of uh, WMS being in the, in the same instance. Now that said, an integrated model for WMS directly integrated on the same instance, that doesn't always serve everyone's needs. So in the most recent release uh, of uh, warehouse management, uh, release 12.1, we've also uh, provided a distributed deployment option. So in this option, we still have the ERP system with the financial procurement uh, order management inventory out there uh, acting as the uh, central repository of data for our enterprise. But in, in the distributed deployment, warehouse management is, is pulled out of that instance and resides on its own instance. So it's decoupled, but um, with Oracle's warehouse management uh, talking to Oracle ERP, Oracle eBiz, even though it's decoupled, we still provide some standard integration uh, that's packaged up and available. It's based on uh, something called ODI, which is Oracle Data Integrator. It's part of the Fusion Millware suite. Uh, and we have uh, data maps and ODI integration available for uh, warehouse management in version 12.1, uh, interfacing back to 11i10, or 12.1, interfacing back to a, a different instance of, of 12.1. So this decouples uh, warehouse from uh, the host ERP and uh, decouples it from the versioning, so you can have a different version on your host uh, system than you do on your WMS, and also decouples the uh, downtime and patching window. So uh, when one is down, when the host ERP is down for a maintenance window, uh, warehouse doesn't have to be down. Now with some of the hot patching features that 12.2 uh, uh, and, and uh, releases that uh, use the uh, more advanced uh, uh, database uh, uh, features, uh, with hot patching in that, some of that will probably, the need for, for those downtime windows will go away. But um, this deployment option does make sense for some customers in some instances. Um, you know, sort of overall, I'll say that I uh, still prefer the integrated approach because the, uh, the warehouse management is, is resident right on the instance. But in a lot of cases, like I said, um, this deployment option uh, makes sense for some customers. So just, uh, you know, a few uh, thoughts on uh, some of the business drivers that drive the uh, purchase of a, of a WMS or reasons why somebody would want to uh, deploy WMS. And in talking about deployment, uh, a couple of uh, different options. The integrated option, which has already uh, always been around, and the um, distributed option, which is uh, fairly new. All right. Fantastic. Back to you, Thank you so much, Mike. And again, if anybody has questions for Mike, uh, go ahead and put them into the uh, chat window and, and say, you know, for Mike. And then uh, when we come to the Q&A period, we'll actually uh, go ahead and uh, answer those. Uh, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Amin Sikander, who's a principal with uh, Gaia Global Technologies. And uh, without further ado, Amin, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Todd. And thank you, Mike, for that excellent overview. Good morning, everybody. My name is Amin Sikander. I head up the value chain execution practice for Gaia Global. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, let me just take a brief minute to introduce our company to you. We are essentially a premier software consulting firm focusing on Oracle value chain and Primera products. We are founded in 2006 by the architects of Oracle's value chain products. We had got in San Mateo with offices in India as well which really gives us a global presence. We are currently helping customers in the role of WMS and other products in Asia, Europe, Middle East, and North America. We are not only a long-standing Oracle Gold customer, we are an Oracle development partner as well. We are currently helping Oracle build products and integrations. Now this slide specifically about a value chain execution team uh, I think illustrates what uh, we believe separates us from our competitors. Essentially that our value chain execution team is founded by some of the people who have designed these products in the first place. That combined with decades of consulting experience really gives us in-depth product knowledge plus an appreciation of you know, real world challenges and opportunities. And here are a few of our sample customers. A couple of them, uh, Zebra, we helped them with the global rollout um, of WMS or, or 
for a period of two years. We just went live at all the North American facilities last month, as did Yahoo. You know, Huawei is uh, one of the world's largest implementation of WMS. We went live uh, the pilot phase end of December, and we're helping them roll out. Okay, so moving on. Um, Talking about uh, WMS in particular, as Mike mentioned, there are specific business drivers and business reasons that you would want to you know, invest in a, a WMS system. Now, the first step really, before we get to the actual features of Oracle WMS, is to take a look at your actual warehouse layout. And for those of you who are in the business of running your warehouses, this is all probably old hat. But I'm bringing this up for a couple of reasons. One, as Mike mentioned, the demand patterns have changed over time and do change over time. Customers, is, it's a trend that we're seeing nowadays that customers you know, order much more frequently and much less uh, quantities. So the warehouse you started off with a few years ago may not be meeting your requirements today. Secondly, you know, it is important that your system integrator who is implementing the actual Oracle WMS system understand your business and understand what your true requirements are. Because Oracle WMS has a lot of capabilities and a lot of features. The trick really to a successful implementation is making sure you, you choose the right configuration of the product to help support your business uh, processes. So these are a few of uh, your sample warehouse layout. And by warehouse layout, I, I'm talking primarily in two aspects. One is the actual flow of the material, as is depicted here. In the various ways, you can set up your warehouse for the material flow, U-shaped or L-shaped. But whatever it is, the primary goal essentially is to have a smooth flow of material to minimize the heading, which is essentially minimize travel time and avoiding people having to walk back and forth as they are performing their task. The second object of setting up your, your, your warehouse is to look at your storage locators and see if they meet your requirements. And for this, you really have to start by identifying your core objective. Is it to increase your picking efficiencies, or is it to maximize space utilization? Now, in an ideal world, the answer would obviously be yes, both, right? Um, however, in the real world, the compromises have to be made. So it, it's good to keep your primary objective, your primary driver in mind. Now, the, the overall objective is obviously to decrease your turnaround time to optimize your space utilization by minimizing your material movement and handling, thus lowering costs and increasing your productivity. Obviously, you have to account for safety considerations as well. Next, look, you start by looking at your demand profiles, by looking at your orders. And there are companies that you know specialize in doing nothing but this, and this could be a full-blown project by itself. But even if you choose not to go down that road, right? There are some basic analysis that you or your system integrators can do for you that really provide some valuable insight. Um, for this, for example, is from one of our customers uh, that we have, uh, one of the largest flow care manufacturers uh, and distributors in the world. They, they were set up to be you know, purely a, a pallet pick driven warehouse. Um, we took a look at their order profiles to figure out exactly what their order profiles look like what kind of orders they were getting, what kind of picks they were getting, and to help them figure out how big of a forward pick locator they would need, for example. Second, for the same customer, we analyzed those orders by customers. Um, we knew, for example, that this specific uh, client of ours, the top two customers were Walmart and Target, and they constituted a significant percentage of the demand. When we looked at it, we found out that you know actually about twenty percent of the demand was driven by these two customers, and this posed some unique challenges because Walmart, for example, was ordering the same products, and there was a specific day in the week that the warehouse would have to ship for Walmart orders. However, we could not dedicate a forward pick locator just for those locator just for those particular products because for the other four days of the week, those products were not really being used. So options were really to have either a dedicated Walmart line or to use a version of push replenishment, which is now a feature that Oracle WMS uh, R12 provides and that I'll talk about in more detail in this context in a few slides now. Second is look at your SKU profiles. Look at your you know SKU velocity, you know, whether they're fast-moving items, slow-moving, or medium. 
look at your SKU categories because you have some constraints based on your product classifications, either if the control substances or they need to be stored in a specific uh, control environment, you have to account for those. Plus the SKU dimensions and the unit of measures as well. You know, do you sell them in ages, cases, pallets? So once you do that, that that provides you some more insight as well of a, a different customer here, for example, we did a basic analysis and we figured out that about 66% of their orders were actually for what they call the service part side of the business. One, one, one section of their business was for finished goods, the rest was for you know service parts. Now, the warehouse is really set up for pallet picking for the most part, for racking and shelving. But how the order profile really dictated the need for a separate area for the service parts business, especially you know, a, a large part of the service parts uh, orders were single line orders as well that always went parcel. So they started off with you know a service parts area that looks something like this because they were not really set up to handle this kind of uh, these kind of orders and these kind of volumes. After our analysis, you know we recommended that they reconfigure a part of the warehouse. Uh, and we set up a separate shelf area for these service parts and divided those into a true a cluster picking kind of scenario where people could uh, stay in their zones, pick multiple orders into each door, and pick and pass on to the next person down on the conveyor. Like I said, now a, a lot of this analysis can be done with really basic data. If, if for example, you're a current Oracle WMS user, it could be as simple as dumping out all your completed tasks from your control board and slicing and dicing the data. If you don't already have Oracle WMS, uh, you could just dump out your, your, your sales or a picks over a course of time and take a look at that to, to come up with some of these basic metrics. The goal basically is to, once you identify what your, your orders, any your customers and your, your SKUs dictate you have, you match that against what you actually have, the size of your warehouse, the number of types of locators, the equipment you have, and the resources that you have to fulfill those tasks. Once you're done, once you have a basic understanding of your order profile and your 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 your, your SKU profiles, then you can start setting up your system, the Oracle WMS system, to meet those requirements. And a key part of that is the Oracle Rules Engine, it allows you to you know set up like picking, put away, and replenishment strategies. Now the key here is that you know all these strategies, you should probably think of them as a, you should probably have them working in sync with each other. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make sense to have a put away strategy that uh, directs you to a specific configuration. For example, let's say your put away is directed to you consolidating like items together. Now that doesn't make sense if your order patterns don't require that, or if your order patterns will actually in fact get you away from that. So your, your put away is trying to do something, and your your picking is doing something completely different. Now, one of the most common requirements uh, that we come across is the, the basic FIFO and uh, FIFO-based allocation uh, requirements. Now, with regards to FIFO, you have to be uh, you have to decide how strict of a FIFO you really want, because some industries mandate that you ha absolutely have to pick the oldest possible material, and, and that's fine. And but no. the unfortunate truth of the matter is that it comes with certain Reductions in uh, picking efficiency. If you always have to pick the oldest material, that may not be the most efficient uh, way to pick. And uh, it might involve you breaking down a pallet, for example, to grab a specific piece of an item that's the oldest. So a lot of customers where it's not really mandated, um, they really let the replenishment part of the business drive FIFO. So they would have a forward pick locator, a forward pick zone, and replenishment would ensure that the oldest material from the bulk would be replenished down to the forward pick locator. Picking, it would drive the users to the old, uh, oldest locator in those forward pick locators, but once it gets to the locator, the, 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 the clients don't really care as to which specific uh, piece of material the user is picking. If there are multiple lots, for example, of the multiple serials, which is a better example, once it gets down to the golden zone or the forward pick locator, as long as the system directs the user to the oldest locator, at that point it doesn't really matter as much which particular speeds you pick. It gives the users more flexibility and reduces time in picking. Now, 
going back to the previous example I had about those single line orders, I mentioned that you know, this for this particular customer, a large percentage of the orders were single line orders. Now for the rest of the business, we had implemented a consolidation strategy. By that I mean like all orders were consolidated by delivery at the staging lane. So we would utilize a way picking methodology where multiple people were picking the same order over you know, different parts of the warehouse. And these would all get consolidated down to a single staging lane, down to one delivery, which would then be loaded onto a truck or a trailer. Now, this didn't really work very well with the single line orders because one each line is a delivery by itself. And these take up a lot of staging lanes. So the, the customer in this in this particular instance ended up with a scenario where they had to create a lot of virtual staging locators, you know, which they denoted by you know barcoded pieces of paper. Said, this is staging lane one. This is the other one uh, over there. That's staging lane two. This didn't, didn't make sense for them, and it actually you know slowed down picking quite a bit. But because it took in some cases about five minutes for the picker to figure out where the appropriate staging locator was. So rather, we used a very simple solution. We created a put-away strategy that looked at the single line orders and said, if it's a single line order and the weight of the order dictates that it's a parcel, then direct that to a separate staging supplementary called parcel. That way, you segregate your single line orders away from the rest of your orders. Now, all allocation next is a new methodology that Oracle introduced in R12. This is specifically used for what I like to call rolled or continuous products, products such as a cable or wire. So for example, if, the, if you have a reel of cable sitting there, which is about uh, 510 feet, and a customer orders at a 500 feet of uh, cable, now it's not possible for the picker to go and actually get 500 feet. It's not possible for him to cut that reel right there. In those kinds of scenarios, it makes sense for Oracle to over allocate up to the shipping tolerances that the user defines to all allocate so that the user can actually pick the entire reel and ship it. The allocate by pick order measure is uh, probably one of the most popular uh, pick methodologies uh, employed. And essentially what it does is this is probably one of the most efficient ways that you can allocate your product. So for example, let's say you have an order for 515 inches, which is essentially uh, uh, translates to a pallet and three cases. Now, if you were to release this with a normal pick methodology, what, would ha what could happen is one of two things. One, you could either deplete your forward pick locators completely because you don't have 515 uh, you know, ages sitting there. There's not enough space. Or you could end up with partial pallets in your bulk storage. So then you grab, go grab one pallet, and then you grab you know, three cases from a, a different pallet. What the allocate the pick you know, measure does is it actually breaks that single allocation down into two pieces based on the pick unit of measure. It creates a pick task for a pallet, and it creates a pick task for the three uh, cases in this scenario, which can then be dispatched to the appropriate resource, can be picked, and can be consolidated to a single staging lane. The next uh, big piece that Oracle introduced in R12 is wave planning. And this has really been a huge benefit uh, you know, for our customers. Prior to this, there was really no way that users could uh, create a way that really fulfills their requirements. They would just have to use their standard pick release form uh, and the rather limited criteria that's available there to uh, release a bunch of orders. And then they had to deal with the consequences. There was no proactive uh, method of looking at what would uh, be released, you know, what resources you would need, what orders would we get back ordered, and so forth. Wave planning allows you to create waves based on multiple different criteria. It allows you to plan the wave, to simulate it, to figure out exactly what resources and uh, what orders that you could you want to uh, tackle in this way. You can refine that wave, you can release it, and then you can monitor and adapt to any, any changes in the warehouse. So let's take a specific example, which is you know, handling of back orders. You know, how, how is that different with wave planning as opposed to uh, pre-wave planning days? In the pre-wave planning days, you really didn't have much of a choice. You release a group of orders. If it back orders, nothing really much you could do about it. You had to go back in and, uh, you know, if, for example, you had a high, or, a high priority order that you wanted to get 
allocated ahead of another order. There was nothing you could do systematically to make that happen. You would have to unallocate one order, reallocate the other order. It was a very manual process and a very time-consuming process. With wave planning, for example, you can start by creating a wave by multiple different criteria. For example, you can say you know, all orders with a dock appointment in the next two hours or all UPS uh, orders or all high-priority orders. Once you create a detailed criteria, and as you can see on the window on the top, it's very similar to the standard Oracle rules engine in terms of the flexibility it gives you in building these waves. You can, you know, you can have as in you know, advance or criteria such as the single line order scenario I was talking about. You could say, you know, pick all single line orders and if the total weight or is, is less than 250 pounds, that's going to go parcel. So I want to release all those lines ahead of time. It also allows you to create um, and plan in one step or multiple steps based on whatever you, you, you want to do. And you can refine your, your, your consolidation criteria to an extent here if you want to create deliveries across orders or you know, within an order for this particular wave, you can choose to do that. Once you create your wave, you can plan your wave. And this is where the back order, where back order handling scenario comes into play here. You have multiple options here. You can choose based on, if you have a limited amount of inventory, you can choose to what you want to do with the back order situation. Do you want to back order the lines? Do you want to remove all the lines that ship set from the wave? Or do you want to remove the entire order from the wave? These are options that you know you never had before. You, oh, you had to do all these steps manually. Once you, you plan your wave, you can then release your wave, or you can simulate it and figure out exactly what you're going to get. You, you will see, based on task types, what resources you would need. You will see the number of back orders that you could potentially get. At this point, you could choose to you know, remove some of your low priority orders and, and uh, release it again to make sure your high priority orders get the limited amount of inventory that you have on stock. Once you're done refining a wave, you can firm and release the wave, which sends the task to the warehouse. Once you're done with the allocation and the wave process, now this is about the actual execution of the SPIC task. And this goes back to your, your, your demand profile analysis and your SKU profile analysis. Because uh, there are, you don't have to pick one pick methodology. And a lot of our customers don't. Uh, it's based on the areas, the warehouse, based on the kind of uh, products you're picking you might find it more beneficial to have a certain kind of picking methodology for a certain kind of a certain area in the warehouse and a different one for a different section. A wave picking, for example, you know, is used mainly for if you're picking multiple picking, people picking the same orders. If you have a range of orders that are pretty large, uh, that is more efficient to have multiple people picking. Uh, that it's, constitutes a mix of you know pallet picks, uh, each picks, and each and case picks. You don't want the same person to be doing all those. So you can have uh, three different people or X number of people going and picking different orders at the same time. Now each of those uh, particular pickers could be handling more than one order, but when it comes down, when it comes time to drop it, when it comes to the staging lane, they're all directed to an appropriate staging lane or to a LPN so that the deliveries get consolidated and can then can be packed and shipped. Cluster picking, on the other hand, you use for a large number of orders with an average volume. A, a user can tell the system the size of the cluster he wants to pick, whether he wants to pick 16 orders at a time or 8 orders at a time or four, based on how big his cart is and how many toes can fit in a cart. That's a, that's a typical cluster pick scenario. Um, where a user pushes around a trolley cart with multiple bins and they're picking different orders into different bins. This combined with cartonization is a new feature in R12. It's called cluster picking by label, where you can not only be picking, but you can be packing at the same time as is shown on, on the box, on the diagram on the right. Bulk picking I talked briefly about uh, last time. Um, essentially, this is a scenario where you have multiple orders for the same item, which 
if released separately, would all have constituted four different tasks in this example. However, the bulk picking, all those different uh, order lines can be consolidated into one pick task for one pallet, say, which can then be directed to the appropriate resource. The picker then goes and picks an entire pallet, and then it drops off individual order lines to different staging lanes. A far more efficient way of picking than you would normally otherwise have to execute it. Pick and pass is another pick methodology where uh, you pick by the use cartonization. You pick and pass uh, from one zone to another. People are segregated by zones. And you, if you can actually go to the extent of forming what's called a bucket brigade, where basically you have a group of people who are self-organizing. You don't necessarily direct a specific task to specific people, but they, they scan the tote that they're working on, and they get the task for the tote. Once they're done with that, they move on to the next one. The big advantage of that is that you kind of eliminate some of the bottlenecks that you see in, in a, just a standard pick and pass scenario. You're, not, you're no longer limited by your slower speaker. Rather, it's your faster speaker that really dictates the space, the, the pace and the flow of the material here. Your other goals at uh, the warehouse are to minimize your handling requirements. And for this, uh, Oracle has uh, you know, a few options here. And to min minimize uh, tasks in general. An interesting new functionality that was introduced is called threshold-based cycle counting. So rather than just relying on your ABC classification, scheduling of cycle counts, and having those tasks performed as uh, discrete tasks out to the users, what you could do is you could define thresholds for items at the locator level. So you can say if an item falls below a quantity of five, for example, I want to pick I have a cycle count task to be executed. So now, as a picker is performing his pick task, and let's say now he's, the, the, the locator he had a quantity of 15 to begin with, and he picked 12. That drove the system to below the threshold level. Now this picker is going to be presented with a cycle count task at that time. He confirms that there's actually only three left, and now you get credit for the cycle count task, and you don't actually have to send another user out to perform that. You can always utilize put-away strategies to drive slotting and replenishment. So when stuff comes in through the door, you can drive your put-away to top off your replenishment locators if FIFO is not a huge concern, or if there's no older material sitting in your bulk storage. You can use uh, cartonization and manifest free picking. Um, again, all, all these topics, to, truth be told, you know, probably deserve their own webinar. And in the interest of time, uh, we're basically only touching on the highlights here, but we'd be glad to go into the details of any of these later at some point, or if, you, know, you can reach out to us. But essentially, cartonization allows you to pick and uh, pack at the same time, thus alleviating the necessity for you to handle the material twice. Manifest picking, again, is new functionality that Oracle uh, introduced, where you pick and you, you're slapping the labels on at the same time as you're picking. So it reduces one, le one more step in the whole pick, pack, and ship process. Crosstalking has been available for quite a while now. Oracle started off with what they call opportunistic crosstalking. So for example, when material comes in through your inbound doctors, the usual flow is that the material is received and put away to your storage. Then you release your orders, material gets picked, staged, and shipped. With opportunistic cross-talking, when the material comes into the door, when the user scans the LPN to put it away, the system will automatically go and look for any back orders for that material. If there are any, it's going to direct the user to take that material directly to the outbound staging lane where it can then be merged up to the rest of the order. With R12, Oracle also introduced the concept of planned cross-talking as opposed to opportunistic. But planned where you, know, you have a situation where you have a lot of orders for um, a particular product that you don't have on hand yet, but perhaps it's on the, it's in the water and you know you have a specific PO for it or an ASM that's coming in. You can peg that saves orders against those um, POs so that when it does come in, it's already automatically reserved against uh, the sales order, and you can minimize your handling. It can be directly picked and uh, back to ship. 
Next, you, know, you can use you know, task types and equipment uh, creatively to minimize deadheading and to make sure that you, you, your users don't get in the way of each other. Now, some of those can be accomplished by creating different uh, sub inventories in Oracle, but it's not re always realistic to do so. In the case of the VNA, the very narrow aisles, for example, it doesn't really make sense to you know create each aisle as a separate sub. That's too much maintenance. You could instead model a specific equipment for each aisle and have users sign on to that equipment and perform big tasks. Replenishments. Again, brand new features introduced in Oracle R12, WS R12. I mean, prior to that, we had a usual min-max replenishment, whereas you set up min-max levels in your forward pick locators. Once it fell below the threshold, everything with a you know a replenishment task would get generated, which you could then execute. Now, this had a couple of significant drawbacks. One, a lot of customers didn't have enough uh, space in the forward pick locators to handle you know, a day's worth of demands. That's just the reality of the business that perhaps you know your warehouse is not large enough for you to have the luxury. And two, a lot of them didn't have uniform demand. I Min max you know, implies that your demand is kind of uniform and that you can you know you can manage it using those levels. That's not always the case, and that's what Oracle provided with pull and push replenishment. The difference between the two is in pull replenishment, it's essentially, take, let's take this particular example, where you have an order for 15. You release the order, the system will create the replenishment task based on your, you know, the fact that you have a demand for this and, they, and the fact that your fall pick area doesn't have enough to satisfy it. It's again uh, uh, determined by your min-max levels, but it's done automatically. You release your orders, the refreshment tasks are created, those tasks are executed, and then the pick tasks get executed subsequent to that. What this gets you is that you're not reliant on your replenishment tasks having been executed uh, before you release your pick waves. It's a, it was always a manual process before. With dynamic pull replenishment, all that is automated, so even if you have a limited uh, amount of space in the forward pick, the system manages that automatically for you. The difference in push replenishment is that push replenishment is for non-uniform demand. Going back to the first scenario I was talking about where you know one of our customers had Walmart as their customer, and they had the situation where they had to pick a specific item on, on Wednesdays, because Wednesday was always Walmart day for them, on Wednesdays. Now, they didn't want to go and pick from the bulk locators, but neither did they want to have a dedicated or pick locators for those. So based on just what they required for that day, the system can create a push replenishment. You can execute the replenishment task, and then you can release your orders and picks. So in our scenario, for example, they would clear out a specific area in the staging dock and say, okay, this is our Walmart uh, forward pick area for today. Let's go create the, the push replenishment, bring it down here, and then we'll release and pick from here. Next, uh, there's various automation features. Uh, voice speaking, carousel, and pick to light are some of the most commonly used ones. In the interest of time, I'm going to um, skip over these. The one thing that you should um, do as part of your uh, your warehouse operations is you, ha you have to track labor productivity. And, and Oracle R12 with the labor management gives you a lot of tools to do that. It's only if you start tracking your labor can you and effectively measure where you are um, and how, if you're getting better or not. Besides, it provides you with a powerful set of tools to be used in the WAVE dashboard. Okay, distributed WMS and LSP, we kind of figured that uh, this would have to be a different uh, webinar uh, by itself. Oracle, has, I mean, Mike has already given you an overview of Oracle uh, DWMS. But hopefully, we will drive down much more into detail uh, at a later point. Same thing with LSP. The two main things that LSP brings, uh, bring, gives you uh, to keep in mind is the client management and third-party billing, uh, where you can stripe your items 
by your client. It gives you much better visibility, allows you to create client-specific roles, client-specific labeling roles, picking roles, and so forth. And also allows you the ability to bill each client based on your handling of their material called activity-based billing. All right, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Don. Apologies for taking up a little bit more time than I intended, Don. No problem, Amin. Thank you very much. Okay, so let me go ahead and get us right back into here. All right, so um, I'll quickly go through a little bit on Redline Solutions. Uh, we're a 15-year-old company. We are an Oracle Gold partner. Uh, we specialize in uh, data collection and have been working with Oracle really since the release of uh, WMS and MSCA to help their customers implement wireless uh, networks, mobile computing, and barcode printing. Uh, we work with all sizes of companies and we have currently over 45 sites that are running Oracle, WMS, or uh, MSCA across the world. Uh, we have skilled systems engineers provide ongoing support for our installed customer base and have a strong reputation for outstanding customer service. Don, I, I don't believe your switch present as yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I think I, I think we okay, uh, I, we've it, got it now. Yep, Thank yep. you, though. Nice. Um, this is a quick map that shows where our North American installations are. Uh, most of our customers are larger customers with multiple sites. Uh, some of the representative customers that we have installed uh, in the last few years are uh, Shutterfly, the photo sharing company, uh, Verifone, uh, which is a company that does the transaction terminals, Agilent Technologies, uh, Herbalife International, and Greenball Corporation. Do a quick overview of what that hardware is, and basically there's several components that are involved in the mobile and wireless um, printing um, and data collection with Oracle. Uh, first of all, we'll go through a basic overview here. Uh, what you have here, and it's called the mobile transaction server on here, uh, you've heard us call it the MWA server, which is how it's known uh, within Oracle. This is basically the transaction server that allows the graphical interface that you would see on your desktop to actually get the same information coming from a mobile device. That mobile device is then connecting through a wireless network that can be either local uh, on your network or over a wide area network, goes to this transaction server, which then processes the transactions within Oracle. Uh, as far as the infrastructure goes, this is a good kind of overview. You've got Oracle up uh, top. You've got the MWA server over here. You've got your wireless switch, which is controlling these different access ports or access points. Uh, we have our mobile devices down here. We have our barcode printers, which can be uh, connected to the network or wireless. And then we have our device management software. I'll do a little bit deeper dive on each one of these. Uh, before I do, though, I want to make sure that you're clear on the MWA server and what it does. Again, it's the application server for the mobile devices. It has a very scalable architecture with a built-in load balancing uh, using something called the MWA dispatcher. Uh, the mobile devices are either Telnet or GUI clients. And the nice thing about this is it's the same hardware requirements whether you're using WMS or uh, MSCA. Um, what we'll see here on this slide is for that MWA load balancing, uh, it's done through the dispatcher. And each uh, instance of the dispatcher takes between 256 and 512 uh, megabytes of memory. Uh, each one will serve 15 to 20 mobile uh, uh, users, uh, you can have up to 10 MWA server uh, instances on one dispatcher and multiple dispatchers. So it's a highly scalable uh, architecture that really supports a 24 by 7 uptime. Uh, now I want to shift our attention to the mobile devices. Uh, first of all, in warehouse environments, the most common device used are these mobile uh, rugged devices here that are for uh, really kind of a gun style that the, the operator will either have mounted on their forklift or in a holster. Uh, we also have vehicle mount terminals that you see here on the right, as well as rugged uh, terminals, which some of them actually have outdoor viewable screens. So again, depending on the type of information and the type of transaction, we have the right tool uh, for that application. 
typically on these devices, again, as we're looking at some of the durability standards, we're looking at things with a minimum of a six-foot drop to concrete uh, with a wide operating temperature and an IP64 or better ceiling. On the wireless network itself, uh, the current uh, state-of-the-art is really a switch controller-based architecture which allows you to have a fault-tolerant, redundant controller that is talking to all of the different radios. Uh, and one of the other nice things about this is as a browser-based configuration console, which means that literally your support people, as long as they have access to the network, uh, can get into it from any browser anywhere. Uh, it allows us to control multiple access uh, points and ports. And I show a couple different types here. Here's a traditional access port that you would see in a facility. The one you see up here is actually an outdoor one that would typically be mounted on a light pole. Uh, the uh, optional wireless network security and intrusion protection is uh, something that we can go into some more detail on. Uh, at a high level, it allows you to make sure that you don't have unauthorized users uh, getting into your network. And if you get the intrusion uh, protection system, the next level up from this, you can actually knock them off of your network. Uh, we often in include enclosures for the uh, access uh, ports when they're in dusty environments to just keep them uh, safe from the elements. Uh, moving on here, one of the critical things when you're doing wireless is to do a site survey. And basically, as the slide shows here, a, a site survey is a blueprint for your wireless install. Uh, what you're seeing down here below are heat maps that show the signal coverage in as an overlay over your facility. What you're seeing in this lower left-hand corner is actually a map of a facility that shows not only where the access points are in these particular dots, but also the cabling paths and where they connect into. OK, uh, moving right along, the next part here is to talk a little bit about the wireless device management software. And one of the elements I talked about is most Oracle clients have multiple sites, and so their help desk support is very important for them. What this wireless device management does is, is it provides you a central console for managing all of the mobile devices. Uh, it gives you access uh, for your help desk to do remote desktop support for the uh, devices. So they could have remote sites that they can say, hey, I'm having a problem on my gun. They can actually log on and see exactly what's happening. Uh, what's nice about this is that sometimes your, your users will go in and actually change settings on devices. And with the, this device management software, what it ensures is every time a user logs in, it checks against the golden image and says, A, does it have the right program on it? B, does it have the right local settings? And C, <coughs> is it configured for uh, my wireless network? So uh, this is an important tool that is used by uh, customers who are deploying these mobile devices. Now I want to shift uh, focus for a minute to barcode printing options. Uh, we have our traditional network printers that uh, can be connected. As I mentioned before, networks now can be wired or wireless. Uh, that includes the portable devices can be wired to a device. More commonly, they're set up as wireless, so they just look like network printers. And in some environments, it makes sense to bring the mobile workstation to the work. So what we're seeing here on this print cart is actually a wireless printer that would be connected to the network and allow us to actually send um, that signal down to it and do printing right there off of the station. Basically, what you see at the bottom here is there's a, a giant battery there. So these uh, devices can run for uh, 8 hours, 12 hours, 16 hours, depending on the configuration of the print cart to, uh, that is used. So speaking about uh, barcode printing within Oracle, a, a couple common things you should be aware of is uh, all the printing from Oracle use BI Publisher. Uh, the data format comes down in XML strings. Um, automated label printing can be triggered by specific business events in the WMS environment, uh, which again ties back to the rules-based framework, which not only allows you to trigger the label printing, but also to have rules-based uh, label selection. So if you had a customer who had a specific label format that they needed, you could tie that label format to them so that any time you were printing labels for them, it automatically selected the right format. Um, the direct printing through XML, I'll talk about a little bit on this screen. 
and that is there's really two main options. One of them is to do XML printing where you design the label on a PC and then store that label within the printer's memory, which is shown in this, this illustration. The other is to have an enterprise print server, and in the enterprise print server model, it's basically a, uh, a global enterprise uh, print server that can actually drive the label printing amongst all your different label printers and all different locations. And really, the, the specifics of your application will drive which one is appropriate for you. Uh, the other part I want to talk about briefly is the barcode scanner. So we've been focusing really on the mobile devices, but you may have stations um, such as that print cart or other just desktop stations where you just want to plug in a barcode scanner and enter the data directly into an Oracle screen. Okay, so um, I'm sorry about the audio problem. For some reason, our audio had died, but uh, we're back in. Um, Amin, if you're able to hear this, if you could uh, let me know or uh, I can hear you now, Doug. Okay, uh, what slide did it did it drop out on? Was it this one or several yep. before? This one. Okay, good. Um, well, we'll just continue on. So again, we've got multiple scanners here for different options. The higher ones here on the the chart in the upper right can actually be used to uh, be connected via Bluetooth. The rest of them are typically connected via USB. One thing not to forget uh, as we're preparing for this is the actual Oracle sub-inventory locator labels. And these Oracle sub-inventory locator labels come in multiple formats. What I'm showing up here at the top is a traditional rack label. So as you go put items away or you're pulling items, you'll scan that location to confirm where you are. Uh, not everybody stores their products in racks, though. So for those who are not storing in racks, maybe it's a floor stock or it's a specific bay, we have these hanging signs. And you can see these up here uh, as the, the person on the, the forklift is actually scanning up and hitting these signs that can be easily 25, 35 feet away. Uh, normally on those, how we construct them is we actually have a sign that is bent, and then there's actually several holes here so that they can either be put onto a wire that goes across, as in the example on the right, or people may hang them straight down from the uh, ceiling uh, as well. So a couple different options there. And the good news is that Redline can provide you uh, all of these as part of the implementation. Oops, going the wrong way there. Uh, our hardware and software partners include the biggest names in the business. We are a Motorola uh, partner. We're also partner with Intermec, Honeywell, Zebra Technologies, uh, Wavelink, and obviously uh, Oracle. So just to kind of wrap it up, um, really we, we'd like to help you with your Oracle mobility projects. Uh, we really have two of the industry experts with different domain expertise partnering together to deliver you, deliver to you complete uh, solutions.
Uh, if you'd like to reach us, you can contact us via the oracle at redlinesolutions.com or register at the uh, oraclebce.com site that you signed up for today. Uh, at this point, we're going to go ahead and move into our Q&A. Uh, and uh, with that, Chris, I'll ask you, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. We have a number of questions, and so I'll go through them, and Todd, maybe you can route them appropriately as we come in. Sure. Um, so the first one is just sort of pretty basic, uh, which is, do you work with customers in Canada? We actually do. We have uh, customers in Canada uh, today, and uh, it's really not a problem. We have customers actually all over uh, North America and through some of the corporate offices have worldwide installations. Excellent. Next one looks like it's probably for a mean, but so since your presentation was concentrated on setting up your warehouse correctly, if you had experience in the past where you were called in to implement the WMS but found the warehouse was not set up correctly based on the type of inventory movement, and so you know, if you had to reconfigure the warehouse to get the maximum benefits out of WMS? Uh, in some cases, absolutely. I mean, all the scenarios they went through were actually from real-world customers. Like I said, there are companies that uh, specialize in doing nothing but that, in coming in and configuring your warehouses. Uh, we bring that in as uh, just as a, a value add as part of our implementation, uh, depending on the requirements and depending on the scope of the project. Okay. But a basic sort of analysis, yeah, we do. All right, excellent. What about, um, next question is, what are a few criteria that tip the balance when customers are choosing between MSCA and WMS? Um, what I, I, we actually went through that, uh, the last webinar, so I would refer you back to that, uh, to a replay of that, because there are a number of uh, different considerations. You know, the size and complexity of operations, the volume, um, whether you needed directed, uh, directed tasks as opposed to just being user initiated. There's a whole bunch of parameters. Uh, like I said, there's a presentation available already out there if you could refer back to that, or we'd be uh, happy to answer you directly. Okay. Yeah, and, and at a very high level, the, the major difference that I see is that WMS uh, um, is really the directed activities. It's controlling the work. It's business uh, event triggered, whereas MSCA is really just automating the data entry part of it or scanning data in instead of taking it back to your uh, desktop and keying it in. Excellent. And again, as a reminder, as I'm working through these questions, if you have additional questions, please just enter them into the question box on your webinar. All right, uh, next question is, do you have experience in implementing DWMS? Yes, we do. Uh, like uh, Huawei was in a, one of the, the world's largest WMS implementations. It's actually a DWMS. We're currently in uh, uh, two other projects. One, where we're integrating um, DWMS back to uh, PeopleSoft. Uh, uh, ERP, and the other where um, we are incorporating multiple organizations uh, and coming up with a single unified distributed WMS org. So yes, we do have a lot of experience with EWMS. Okay, good. And then this was actually from a separate person, but it follows on. Can we implement LSP along with the WMS? Yeah, uh, yes, you can. LSP, if you think about it, is really a version of DWMS. Rather than interfacing with, with a host ERP system, you're really interfacing with a bunch of different clients. But, but yeah, the, the basic concept uh, in terms of the interface layer is essentially the same. Okay. Good. Um, can you tell me, what's the typical ROI on implementing WMS? I think Mike, uh, at the beginning, went through a whole bunch of different um, uh, slides where he showed a, a different uh, a range of parameters uh, that he can use to measure ROI. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's to not necessarily you know, reduce your labor, but to do more with less, to be more efficient, to be more optimal, to, be, to store less inventory, to use less people to do the same amount of work. Got it. Okay, good. Uh, next one, Todd, would be for you. So I'm interested in the print cart that you showed. You know, can it run for a full shift, for two shifts? Um, how would I get more information about this? So uh, great. First of all, um, 
what's nice about these is that we actually uh, have multiple batteries that can be used. And so what we do is we look at what you're going to plug into it and then determine what that current draw is. And then from there can tell you, hey, you need the one battery version or the two battery version, and uh, we can run with it. We basically have, uh, on standard, I would say an eight-hour shift is reasonable, and you can get up to 16. And when I say up to 16, what we see is typically there are breaks during the day, for instance, a lunch break, or there's uh, breaks between trucks coming in. And in those cases, what we recommend is that you actually plug it in to let it get a trickle charge while that's going on. But if uh, the person who sent that in would like to get more information, uh, send us an email at that oracle at redlinesolutions.com, and I'll get in contact you, with you uh, and provide more detail. Excellent. All right. Next question is, we have MSCA now and have been considering moving to WMS. Is this an incremental move, or do we replace existing mobile transactions? Uh, let me take the hardware for, uh, part first, and I mean, I'll toss it over to you for the, uh, for the WMS part of it. The good thing is on the hardware, it's exactly the same, so you wouldn't have any changes at all uh, moving from MSCA to WMS. Uh, as far as the rest of it, Amin, I'm going to let you answer that one. Right. Um, so a lot of customers actually go that route where they start off with MSCA and then move on to WMS. So it is an incremental move in terms of the hardware, in terms of in the country and the guns and so forth. Uh, MSCA, however, it doesn't really cause you to... Uh, like, like as Todd put it, it's essentially a mobile phantom on top of Oracle inventory. With WMS, uh, you have to set up the rules to the model business processes and so forth. Bottom line is it's incremental. It's a, a lot of stuff that you did for MSCA will be thrown away, but you will have uh, additional setups and you'll have different screens that you'll be using and, and you'll be using LPNs, obviously, with WMS. All Very right. good. Good. And that was our final question for today. Great. Well, listen, uh, everyone, we appreciate you attending today. I apologize for the uh, uh, audio problem that we had. Uh, we do have one more webinar in this series, and that is going to be on Thursday, May 10th, in which we're going to do a deeper dive into MSCA. So if uh, somebody is uh, not quite sure of which one is the best fit, I'd advise you to go back and listen to the uh, webcast that we had on comparing the two, and then uh, join us on Thursday, May 10th for our webinar on using MSCA to drive inventory efficiency. Uh, you can sign up for this at the same location that you uh, signed up for this webinar, which is www.oraclebce.com. And uh, with that, uh, we'd like to thank you for attending. Uh, here's some contact information if you'd like to reach us, and uh, we'd be more than happy to talk to you about uh, any of your